Well, 15 years ago, uh, I was an undergraduate on this campus uh, taking courses on the healthcare system. Uh, and I went back to my slides just to be sure. Um, but in fact, uh, and it's funny to believe, we did not talk about health IT in those classes. It just, at that point in time, was not thought of as a tool that was critical to improving the performance of the healthcare system. And that was despite the fact uh, that we were in Silicon Valley and that all around us uh, data was being used and that even really in other industries we were coming off of two decades of digitization and computerization and we were really beginning to understand the huge potential transformative power that that had to improve the products and services uh, that were delivered. And for me, that contrast uh, really set up the rest of my career and my interest in focusing on what can we learn from other industries that had quite a bit of a head start on healthcare in terms of what it takes to use data and digitization and computers to transform the value in an industry. So what I want to do is spend our time here today talking about three critical cofactors uh, that emerged from the, this, the, the research on other industries and, and the key sort of enablers of value uh, from IT and digitization and talk about where we stand today with those factors in healthcare um, and some of the challenges, uh, many of which uh, Amy uh, alluded to, um, and where we have some opportunities for, uh, for real progress. So just in brief, uh, those are going to be uh, related to data integrity, related to the evolution of work processes around technology and around having, ensuring that we have a conducive policy and set of market incentives to ensure that we use technology to deliver the value that we all see. So first, this idea of a foundation of data integrity, that we need to ensure that the data is usable or else whatever we try to build on top of that foundation is going to be shaky at best. Here, the key insight from other industries is that the real explosion of digital data in, in other industries came as a result of a sort of costless byproduct of business transactions, right? Amazon that's capturing tons of data on what we do just as we are browsing online, looking at different products, uh, clicking on different things. That is fundamentally different than what we're dealing with in healthcare, where we rely on humans to enter a lot of the data, uh, and not data experts, data entry experts, uh, but very expensive humans, doctors and nurses, who have a lot of competing demands on their time and attention. What this means is that there can be a lot of unsystematic errors that are entered into data, uh, and errors that are very hard to detect by software algorithms. As an example, I do a lot of research uh, out, out on the front lines of care, um, and I recently completed a study in which I interviewed primary care providers about how they think about the electronic problem list uh, within their electronic health record. I was shocked by the variation that I heard, even within the same practice. Some physicians saying, oh no, a problem list should only be acute problems. Others saying, no, a problem list should have chronic problems as well as acute problems. A lot of disagreement on whether sort of social and behavioral problems should be captured or not. Um, and so what we're seeing is those differences translating into this variation in the information that gets documented that the, we then want to use as the basis for analytics and learning. So we need to think a lot about these unsystematic errors and how we can ensure that we have this, this robust data foundation on which we build uh, our learning health system and, and analytics. Exacerbating this problem, um, and as any clinician will tell you who's used an electronic health record, is that we have some real challenges with the way that EHRs are designed. And this also can serve as a way to uh, corrupt the data uh, and, and, and introduce unsystematic errors. My favorite example here uh, is a well-known EHR system that on the same user interface has a done button and has a complete button both of which can be clicked, uh, and that capture different data depending on which one you click. When users are interviewed uh, and asked about the differences between these buttons, uh, clear and consistent answers are rare. And so what you can see is that we are introducing as a way, both because we're relying on humans and based on how these systems are designed, we are introducing a lot of errors into the data. 
Um, and that's going to be a challenge then when we go to use it. Uh, if you talk to, uh, to, to folks who try to use big data sets from electronic health data and ask them, how long did it take you to feel like you really understood your data uh, and, and feel like you had a clean data set to use? It's usually about 80% of the time was cleaning and then 20% of the time uh, was analyzing. We need to spend a lot of time thinking about this if we want these data sets to be plug and play where we can just uh, build a, a learning health system in which we pull data from lots of different places in which it was created and then use that as the basis for analytics. So again, the first lesson is we need to think about the data integrity, uh, and we have uh, some challenges that haven't been faced in other industries where they didn't have this human-mediated uh, data entry issue. So the second factor really has to do with the evolution of work processes and the structure of organizations when you have new technology capabilities. Uh, what this picture shows here um, is uh, the turn of the 20th century uh, when the new technology was electricity. Uh, and there was a shift from steam-powered uh, manufacturing to, uh, to electricity. And what this meant was that each worker could have their own individual electric motor. Um, and at first, they just sort of manufactured as usual. They didn't really recognize this powerful new technology that they had at their fingertips. Slowly over time, manufacturing facilities were redesigned so that they went in sequential order, which gave an initial set of big productivity gains. Again, it had nothing to do with the technology itself. It had to do with recognizing that, te that the technology allowed an evolution in work processes and the uh, corresponding efficiencies. But then when every worker had their own electric motor, they had a lot more autonomy and control over the quality of what they produced, the rate at which they produced it. So then there was a second sort of recognition that then contracts had to be redesigned to give workers a lot more sort of responsibility uh, for the work that they were performing in this production process. So what this shows you, again, is the need to think about this co-evolution of work processes and practices around new technology. Really adopting technology is only the first step. It's not an easy step, but it's only the first step. And then we need to think about how do you redesign pro work processes and practices around that. In healthcare, we're really only beginning, I think, to think about what this means. How do we redesign the healthcare system with data at the core? And uh, you know, I, I get uh, concerned about this because when I go out to a lot of, as I said, you know, primary care practices and talk to people on the front lines, and I say, you know, how are you thinking about your electronic health record? And they're like, we just want to work how we used to work on paper, but now we do on an EHR, right? And that is like the wrong way to think about this, right? It's, we do not want to work the same way we've always worked, just entering things into a computer where we used to enter them on paper. We want to recognize that there is a really powerful new tool at our fingertips that allows us to work in very different ways that generate value, and we need to think about what are the evolution of processes that go into place uh, to go along with that and really unlock the potential um, of, of both information technology and digital data. So the third factor that I want uh, to, to, to speak to is ensuring that we have a conducive uh, market and policy environment. Um, and here, uh, you know, in many other industries, um, they were not operating sort of under the same set of conflicting incentives and uh, policies that may have been designed for a slightly different era. Uh, there were really incentives in place to say, put these technologies into place, use data, and realize value from it. Everything was aligned to make that happen. Um, and in healthcare, we really do have this, this tug of war going on sometimes, uh, where we say, you know, we want the learning health system, we want data and analytics. Uh, but when you actually say, are stakeholder incentives aligned to really you know, to really engage with that and to invest real time and effort in doing that, there can be some real countervailing forces there. Um, and so then it creates this disconnect between saying this is what we should all do and the sort of reality on the front lines to say, well, it's not clear that doing this is easy or that it's really in our best interest to do that. Uh, and in this case, we really have to look no farther than uh, over the past decade or so, all the efforts that have been put into promoting greater health information exchange and interoperability. Uh, we all recognize that we want our clinicians to have all the data that they can about our health, uh, and as Amy said, sort of the context around our health uh, at their fingertips. Um, and so as a result of that sense, we've been saying, okay, well, you know, do it. Why aren't healthcare organizations sharing all of our information? Um, and my research has shown that it really boils down to the fact that there are these conflicting incentives to do that. There are reasons that healthcare organizations want to share their data, but there are 
both financial incentives and policies that, that work against that. Um, and when that's the case, it makes it really hard uh, to, to make a lot of progress. Um, and so what we need to do is not just say these tools and technologies are great, but we need to think about the broader environment and make sure that the incentives are in place, the policies are conducive to making that happen. Uh, because if not, we're just going to talk about the learning health system uh, for the next you know, 10, 20 years, saying it should happen, it should happen, it should happen. Uh, but the key stakeholders who need to make it happen uh, they must make sure that we have their incentives aligned to do that and that we've created an environment in which it's what they actually want to and need to do. So uh, in closing, um, I just want uh, to say that, um, you know, that it's easy, I think, to get excited about the technologies themselves and look at these tools and say, oh, this has the potential to really revolutionize healthcare and create enormous value. And that is true, and we should be excited about that and optimistic. Uh, but if we don't think about this broader set of cofactors, it's really going to limit the extent to which we can see that value. Um, and as I, you know, I, I'm optimistic. I think we are really starting to understand the nature of these challenges. We have the benefit of hindsight. We can look at what we know from other industries and say, what did they have to do in order to really realize the value from IT and digitization? Um, but as we understand the nature of these challenges, we have to think and think creatively about how to address them uh, because it's really going to be sort of in that broader environment and addressing uh, not just the technology, but this set of, of broader factors. That is what's going to allow us uh, to realize the potential to make big data something that actually results in better care for each of us um, and make the learning healthcare system a reality. So thank you so much.